Okay, well, um, welcome everyone to the first in a series of webinars about exploring exoplanets. Um, we're really excited to have uh, so many people joining us and um, uh, uh, we'll um, also be recording this session uh, should you want to come back and review any of the resources or if you have colleagues who would like to um, sign up and see it. So um, the this webinar is the first of the series on how to explore exoplanets. The second webinar in December will be how to participate in exoplanet science. And the third webinar will be how to contribute to exoplanet science. So we hope over the course, you'll join us for all three. I wanna do a, a little bit of an introduction here. Um, uh, first, uh, I'd like to give you a, a, a let's get a feel and our, our speakers and presenters get a feel for who you all are. I know you answered this on the registration, but um, in order to answer this poll, you can either use your cell phone to take a picture of the QR code that's on the screen, or you, if you can open up another web browser while you're looking here, you can go to slido.com and type in the number 25748400 and um and answer the poll and uh we'll see ah there we go people have already started excellent um we have um uh optimized this this uh, particular series um for uh educators and folks who want to share learning about exoplanets with others uh but we do know that we have a uh, uh, a um, happy contingent of amateur citizen scientists and students uh, who are also joining us. And, and I think you'll find information that's really good for you as well. All right. So um, we have uh, kind of people across uh, every category here. And um, oops, there we go. Oh, more pre-college classroom. Excellent. So that will help our speakers as well. All right. So the next question I want to ask folks in the um, Slido is to, um, to just type in what word comes to mind when you think of exoplanets. And this is going to automatically generate a word cloud here so we can kind of see if there's anything um, uh, that comes to people's minds. Uh, so um, I'm, uh, ah, excellent, <laughs> alien, citizen science. Okay, well, hope we'll be able to talk about all these things. Oh my goodness, all right. So exploration, uh, lots of, um, lots of topics that hopefully will come up here and uh, exciting is um, definitely one of those. All right, this is excellent. Okay, well, let me um, move on to the programmatic part of the webinar here. Um, we're, uh, uh, I'll do some introductions to start with. This webinar series is uh, supported by NASA's Universe of Learning. I'll let you know what that program is. Um, and the uh, 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 second chunk of the webinar, we're going to uh, uh, explore how to explore exoplanets from the perspective of um, an active researcher who's uh, joining us, and I will introduce her later, but she is waving. I, uh, Juliana Garcia Meia is um, uh, 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 going to give us her perspective as an exoplanet um, researcher. And then the last chunk of the webinar will be uh, exploring a bunch of the resources from NASA's Universe of Learning that are really useful for learning yourself and for sharing with students um, uh, information about uh, exoplanets. So uh, the, the team from NASA's Universe of Learning that is on the line right now includes myself. I'm Mary DeSalt. I'm at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian here in Cambridge, Mass. Um, and uh, uh, I'm a member of the 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 
Center for Astrophysics is one institution of four in the NASA's Universe of Learning team. Erica Wright, and there she is, and Frank Sigowitz, who is uh, behind these planets behind me um, <laughs> in, the, in the same room. We're, uh, uh, Erica is an education specialist. She'll be talking about the um, uh, resources. Frank is our telescope engineer for the microobservatory telescopes, and you'll be hearing more from him next webinar. And then we also have Rachel Zimmerman Brackman here from Jet Propulsion Lab, who's a key partner in NASA's universe of learning, especially around the exoplanet content. Um, I'll give an introduction to Juliana later, a more formal one. Um, but NASA's universe of learning is basically a partnership between Space Telescope Science Institute, uh, our colleagues there uh, are not in the webinar now, but they lead the um, consortium that also includes the Center for Astrophysics, JPL, and Caltech IPAC. And the idea is to um, funded by NASA's Science Mission Directorate, its Astrophysics Division, to engage learners in, uh, in exploring the universe uh, that NASA studies through its astrophysics missions and research. And um, to do that in a way in which having close connections with the science really brings the excitement to the experiences, but also having partnerships with audiences from um, uh, uh, audiences and partnerships from um, uh, diverse backgrounds helps us create resources that are accessible and relevant and meaningful uh, to people from groups that um, may have historically been excluded from astronomy. Because even though uh, you know the sky belongs to everyone and everyone can bring their curiosity uh, to the universe, um, we know that uh, in, in a lot of cases, science as kind of normatively practiced has excluded people. And so we wanna bring resources and design those resources to be accessible relevant, meaningful to as many people as possible. Um, the uh, big questions that are asked in NASA astrophysics are, how does the universe work? How do we get here? And are we alone? And I think you can see how um, those questions are related to today, today's topic. Um, and there's uh, several different astrophysics content themes. So, um, I'm going to just play this short video that kind of gives the overview of NASA's universe of learning before we um, launch into uh, exploring exoplanets in more detail. Here we go. How does the universe work? How did we get here? Are we alone? NASA's Universe of Learning aims to put everything you need to explore the universe at your fingertips. The unique partnership between the Space Telescope Science Institute, Caltech IPAC, the Harvard and Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory provides our team with direct access to intriguing discoveries, scientific data, and experts that span the full range of NASA's astrophysics missions. We combine these assets with best practices and learning to create resources, ranging from captivating videos that motivate science learning to activities exploring telescope data that strengthen science identity. We partner with organizations nationwide to incorporate these resources into community programs and professional learning experiences. Our focus is on meeting the needs of educators and learners in museums, science centers, libraries, and community-based programs, as well as online environments. Subject matter experts ensure the scientific integrity of our work, provide a human connection to science through presentations and interviews, help organizations develop exhibits and science programming, and more. If you are a subject matter expert and would like to participate, or are looking for a subject matter expert, we would like to hear from you. To learn more about our program and what we do, please visit universeoflearning.org.
uh, let's see, was that uh, brings us to the next part of our um, our webinar, uh, having uh, close connections to the science research that goes on. Uh, we think is a key part of helping learners get excited about science and we're thrilled today to have with us uh, Juliana Garcia Mejia, um, who is a doctoral student here at Harvard University and uh, principal investigator on um, an exciting uh, project called the Tierras Observatory. I'm hopefully she'll tell us a little bit about that and um, I'll uh, leave it to you, Juliana. Uh, she's a great friend of the Science Education Department here at the Center for Astrophysics uh, and of uh, engaging lots of audiences in the uh, excitement of discovery. So Juliana, the floor is yours. I will stop my share and allow you to share your screen. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Juliana Garcia Mejia, and I'm so happy to be here with you today. I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. And for those of you who don't have your, your um, cameras on, which is almost everyone, but that's okay. If you wanna turn your camera on, I love to see smiley faces. Um, but if not, I'd love to see some, uh, th some thumbs up so I can make sure that everyone's seeing my screen. So I'm about to share. Let's take a look here. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen. Can you see the keynote? Can I get some thumbs up? Awesome. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. So again, my name is Juliana Garcia Mejia. I am a sixth grader. Juliana, we're Harvard. seeing your pre preview oh. and not the big oh, screen. Let's turn we're it around. We're seeing the presenter mode. There we go. Can you see it now? Awesome. There oh, there you go. And this is one of my favorite time lapses. You'll see I love taking time lapse videos. Um, this is a time lapse taken from Chile. I'm South American, so I love the southern sky. Um, and I love this because it gives us an idea of what we're ex studying as exoplaneteers are studying. Uh, so I'm an exoplaneteer, and what that means is that I look for exoplanets. And an exoplanet, as many of you probably know and are, are becoming experts in, are any of the planets that are orbiting any of the stars that you see in this video and beyond, even stars that we don't see in this video. But of course, our methods right now are just in development. So really the planets that were the exoplanets that we're looking for are mostly within the galaxy. And despite the fact that this is a very new field, we've only been really doing this for the last 30 years. We've learned a lot in the past decades. So let me take you on this little journey with this uh, comics that I love from this YouTube channel called PhD Comics. So as it turns out, as of nine years ago, we know statistically speaking that there are one to three Earth-sized planets for every single star that you look up in the night sky. So around every single star in the galaxy. So that means that the next time you look up at the sky and you see one star, think about the fact that that star has one, two, three, four, maybe five Earth-sized planets, and one or two of those planets is likely going to be in the habitable zone. And there are many exoplanet detection techniques that we can use to detect them. The first one is called the Doppler technique. The Doppler technique or the radio velocity technique basically means measuring the velocity of the stars to see if we can find some evidence that there's something around them. And usually we don't, but every once in a while, there's a star that, talk, that moves, it kind of wobbles. And so as astronomers, we're left asking the question, well, something has to be tugging at this star. And uh, the way that we can figure out whether it's being tugged or not is by looking at the color of light. Because as it turns out, if that star is moving towards you, it's going to become bluer, it's going to appear bluer. And if it's moving away from you, it's going to be redder. And what's actually happening physically is that around that star, there is a planet. And that planet, of course, is feeling the gravitational tug of that star, pulling that star closer, but also the stars being tugged in by the planet. And that is what causes the wobble. And this, and this, with this wobble wobble sine curve, we can figure out what the period of the planet is, but we can also figure out the amplitude, how big that curve is, tells us the amplitude. And this actually explains why the first planets that we ever discovered were hot Jupiters. So you may have, you may recall from last year, well, no, actually not last year, a few years ago, the Nobel Prize went to two astronomers, one of whom I know personally, I'm happy to say, they're called Didier. Oh. They're called, oh, I wonder what it is. 
oh, they're called DDA um, Michael Mayor and DDA Quellos, and they discovered the first hot Jupiter. So they and they did it with this wobble wobble method. But of course, in this in this picture that I just showed you, there's a lot more techniques than the Doppler technique. There's also the direct imaging technique to detect exoplanets. So let's take a look at that again in comics. So direct imaging technique means measure, taking pictures directly of the planets. So imagine that you're a star or the sun and somebody's holding a little candle right sitting in that in that um, on that little on that uh, lighthouse. And the problem of direct imaging means turn, wanting to take a picture from Hawaii uh, of that of that. Oh, let me let me go back. That went back too, way too fast. So the problem of direct imaging basically means you want to take a picture of that candle from Hawaii while the lighthouse is on. That's how hard direct imaging is. That is a really, really good analogy for it. But crazily enough, oh, let's see what happened here. But crazily enough, as it turns out, we can do it. And we can do it. Oh, man. <laughs> here. Crazily enough, we can do it. And the reason why we can do it is because we have these huge, huge telescopes. And these huge telescopes um, allow us to correct for the fuzziness of the atmosphere and to, and to discover all these planets that are directly imaged, directly that we have taken direct pictures of. And this right here on the bottom right of, your, um, of the screen is H HR8799, and it has four planets that we've discovered by direct imaging. So this is another example. What else can we do? Well, the other detection method that we can do is actually my favorite one. It's called the light curve method or the transit method. In this case, what we're do is we point the telescope at a bunch of star, uh, star, stars and we track how much light is coming from each. Um, and as it turns out, as the planet passes in front of the star, it's going to cause a dip in the amount of light that we're getting from the star. But it's not enough to get it once. We have to get it periodically because that planet's orbiting that star. Now, if the planet's huge, we can get a huge dip. It's the, if the planet's tiny, we get a tiny dip. And so in that sense, the, the, the depth of the well is telling us a lot of information about how big or how small that planet is. And back about 10 years ago, we launched this very famous telescope called Kepler, which looked at a lot of stars in the sky. And it discovered 2,600, not 2,500, but 2,600 planets. Many of them have been confirmed um, in, have been confirmed on the ground. But I'm not done yet. We've gone through three techniques and I still have two left to go. So it, it turns out there's a fourth technique called the transit timing variation. So now you're experts in this. So we have the transit method. So of course we have this planet, this planet's orbiting in front of the star. But the other thing that's happening is that there could be a second planet that's also orbiting in the system. And that planet can actually affect the orbit of the inside of the, of the inside planet. So what's gonna end up happening is that in the light curve, you're not gonna have these very periodic signatures, but you're gonna have all these very wobbly nonlinear signatures. And that is great because it tells you without having seen the second planet, it tells you that there's a second planet in there. So that's another thing that we're doing to detect additional planets. And finally, we have the craziest of them all. This one, I have a lot of trouble understanding, but this animation is so great that I just could not tell you about it. This one's microlensing. So here we're using the gravity of the stars. So imagine you have a star and then there's a star very, very far behind it that is super massive. So of course, light from that star that's very far, it's gonna come towards you, the observer here at the telescope. And the light from that red star is gonna bend, the gravity is gonna bend that light towards the telescope. It's gonna act like a lens. That's why it's called microlensing. And it's gonna look like a little blip in your data. But as it turns out, a few years ago, a few astronomers discovered that there was a blip, an additional blip in the data because there was a planet around that star in the front and that blip looked a lot like that little red blip that you see in the bottom right corner of the plot. So microlensing really, there's this really, there's this really awesome, um, there's this really awesome uh, story about microlensing that goes this way. There's a conference and a scientist asks another scientist who was presenting on microlensing, wait, so let me get this straight. You're measuring planets that you never see around stars you never see. Is that right? And that is right. 
With microlensing, we measure planets that we never see around stars that we never see. But it's definitely very, very exciting for its own reasons, and we can talk about it later. All right, so that is a lot of information. I know there's a video about this. You can review it uh, on YouTube. You can share it with your students if you want. It's found here, bottom left, phdcomics.com, and I'll give this information to Mary. And you can, all, of course, use all of this uh, in your classes. I just love this cartoon so much. So that's an overview of all of the many ways that we're using to find exoplanets. So a natural question would be, how many planets have we actually found? And the best place to figure this out is by going, in my opinion, to the NASA exoplanet archive. This is like the, there's this character in the Thor movie um, that's like the, the, the protector of all the realms. This is like, this is like the protector of all the realms for us. So here's where we have all the information of where the planets are. And this is where you can get the most up-to-date information. And I actually, you know, even though I work on this field, there's so many people discovering so many planets now that we have to, um, that I have to check very, very regularly this website. And here you can see in the top right corner or the top left corner of the, of the screen, so far we have confirmed 5,197 planets. And that is as of November 2nd. So we've discovered a ton of planets and I just don't have enough time to give you a great overview of, um, of how diverse and how interesting all of them are. But I figured we could do something like this. We could take a look at an example of some of the smallest planet, an example of some of the biggest planets, an example of what are the most common types of planets, and then an example of how it is that my research fits into all of this. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example of what are the smallest planets, the smallest exoplanets out there. A great example is Kepler 20e. So Kepler 20e is a system around a G star. It was discovered uh, by the Kepler telescope, the one I showed you that uh, in the animation that looks at a lot of stars. And that is a system that is located uh, 700 light years away. So it's quite a ways away. Very difficult to very difficult to uh, do further observations on it because of how hard how far it is. But you can see what's interesting about the system is that although the star is a G star, so that means it's a star very similar to our sun, all of its planets, its its uh, planets one, two, three, four, five planets are interior to the orbit of Mercury. And what's more interesting is that if you can take a look at the if you take a look at the sizes of the planets, you'll see that something that doesn't happen in the solar system is happening in the system, which is that unlike in the solar system, there's like a big planet, small planet, big planet, small planet, big planet, small planet. That doesn't happen in the solar system. In the solar system, we almost have the planets arranged in size as we go out. Almost. Mars is very small. And Kepler 20e is really, really, really tiny. It has a radius of about 0.86 times the size of the Earth. So you can see it here in comparison to some of the other planets in the solar system, like Venus and the Earth. So I really, really love this planet because it's tiny and it shows you just how diverse the how diverse uh, planets out there really are. What about on the other side? What about about the biggest planets out there? Well, on the biggest, on the bigger side, we have some really massive guys, but things get very complicated. So let's start with a planet that we've confirmed very, very well. That is Hat P67b. You can see it right here it's to the right of Jupiter, just to give you a sense of how big it is. This planet is 900 light years away. This is, of course, an artist's rendering of it. Um, and it has about twice the radius of Jupiter. But interestingly enough, it only has about 30% of the mass of Jupiter. So it is super puffy. It's like, it's really like a cloud. It's very, it's gaseous atmosphere. It's very, very, very tenuous. For many years, this puzzled many of the people that have been studying it. But as it turns out, although this planet is one of the largest, it is not the largest. The thing is that it's very difficult to figure out what is the largest exoplanet discovered. I did, I was doing a lot of research in that exoplanet archive I showed you earlier when I was putting this presentation together, but it's very difficult to figure out what the biggest planet out there is. And the reason for that is actually an active area of research. So I wanted to share that idea with you guys as well. And the best way to show you that idea is in this image right here. So here we're seeing a picture of the sun. Of course, you only see a little portion of it. Then we see a picture of a low mass star. We call these M stars. 
And then we see a picture of a brown dwarf. What is that? And then we see a picture of Jupiter and a picture of the Earth. And the reason why it's so hard to share with you what the biggest uh, Earth, what the biggest exoplanet ever found is, is because some of the candidates, it's unclear to us whether they are indeed the largest plan exoplanets we've discovered, or if they're some of the examples of the smallest stars, brown dwarfs, we've ever discovered. So I wanted to share this because through the uh, some of the tools that you that you will that you will use on the DIY planet um, on the using the DIY planet and uh, the and many of the NASA tools that you learn about you'll see that you're going to be finding really big planets and a great um, way to engage with the students would be to ask do you think this is a brown dwarf or do you think this is a very large uh, planet in base or uh, a super large Jupiter Jupiter like planet. So that would be a really interesting question to discuss with the students. All right. So we've talked about the biggest. We've talked about the smallest. What about the most common? Well, um, I would love to. I would love to ask what people think the most common planets are because I before I give you guys the answer. So I've told you. I've given you a range of sizes. I've given you, an, I've told you that we found 5,100 planets so far. So it'd be great if you could write in the chat, if you're willing, and, and make a guess. Your guess is as good as mine and as every other astronomer, seriously. What do you think is the size of the most common planet out there in the solar system? Is there even a, more, a most common planet? Or do you think that we'll, we have, we'll find the exact same amount of all the planets? I'm going to give you guys... A little bit of time to think about it and answer. Amazing. I'm taking a look at the answers. All right, awesome. So we have we have quite a range. All right, let me start over here. So we have Neptune, two times the Earth, Neptune size, super Earth. What is that? Diane, you've been learning about this. Jupiter size, Jupiter size. The most common size should be some size above Earth, Jupiter, Neptune, mini Neptunes. Mario has also been reading about this. Oh, this is a great point. Michael asks, most common are the most common ones that our detection methods are based able to find. Big difference. Yes, I agree. Neptune, Neptune, Earth size are similar. Okay, around Neptune, gas. Okay, you guys have great ideas. And in fact, I can see some of you have been... Um, really reading up on this okay so um i wish we had we could have pulled but we'll do that some other time okay drum roll please what is the most common type of planet in the universe that we know of so far and we'll get back to this point of is it the most common or the or the one we've been observing the most it's not neptune it is not neptune ladies and gentlemen um, good job. Uh, that was a good guess. That was a good guess. Uh, it is not Neptune. They are smaller than Neptune. So if it's smaller than Neptune, does that mean it is an Earth-sized planet? It is not an Earth-sized planet. It is also not an Earth-sized planet, which it's too bad for us and for how we understand Earth to have uh, life to have emerged on Earth, but we'll get into that later. As it turns out, the most common type of planet in the universe, even after having accounted for observational biases, this is really important. This is a really important point that two of you guys raised in the, in the chat. Even after having accounted for observational biases, the most common type of planet in the universe is a type of planet that we do not have in the solar system. They're called super Earths or sub Neptunes. And the radii span somewhere between 1.5 all the way up to four Earth radii. It is super interesting, right? As it turns out, the most common type of planet in the entire universe is not represented in our solar system. And this really kind of elucidates one of the questions that I'm most excited about uh, in the field of exoplanets, which is, you know, we've been doing this research for only really 30 years. Um, and it's been super exciting. We've learned tons, but we still don't know where the solar system fits in the diversity of the entirety of the solar systems in the universe. 
which means we don't really know how commonplace Earth is. We don't really know how commonplace the moons and rings of our gas giant exoplanets are. We don't really know how commonplace the tiny terrestrials in our solar system like Mars and Mercury and Venus are. We don't really know if Neptune and Uranus ice giant planets are common. We just don't know. The best, the best thing I can tell you about the diversity of, of planets out there is that super Earths or sub Neptunes are super common. So we have a long ways to go. We have a long ways to go before we can get to that part of the Star Wars movies where they pull up a, um, where they pull up their uh, their um, holograms of the entire maps of, of the maps of the universe mapped uh, of the of the map of the universe with all of the all of the planets that are habited and inhabited. So we have a long ways to go, but luckily there are people like me who are super excited about this, and we spent their lives uh, want to dedicate their lives to it. And so I wanted to spend the last few minutes uh, telling you about how my research fits into all of this. Um, how is it that we're actually going to figure out whether the solar system and the denizens therein are actually common and ultimately whether there is life elsewhere in the universe. And my story actually starts in Latin America. I am Colombian. And this is actually a picture of my farm in Colombia. Uh, I come from a family of coffee growers, and I, beca I became enamored with the skies because at night, you know, there's not a lot of pollution. And so this beautiful skies would be teeming with stars. And my uncle would sit us all cousins down and would ask us lots of questions about astronomy. But the question that fascinated me the most is the one I just shared with you, which is, is there life? elsewhere in the universe. And as it turns out, you know, there's many ways that one can go from many disciplines about answering this question. There's philosophy, there's biology, uh, and there's astronomy. And for many astronomers, the path to answering this question really starts with figuring out where and whether there are Earth-sized planets in the galaxy. And those planets have to be, of course, the size of the Earth, but they also have to be close enough that we can then measure their masses to see if they also have the same mass as the Earth, and that we can take a look at their atmospheres to see what might be lurking in those atmospheres, whether there could be carbon dioxide, water, methane, oxygen, ozone, all of these things that we know on Earth are really important for life. And I also use the transit method in my research. This is kind of like the workhorse method of all those methods of research I showed you. This is really the workhorse method. But here's the challenge. If we we're looking for an Earth-sized planet around a sun-like star, that dip in the curve would be so tiny that it would be basically impossible to measure. We've really, um, we've really found no Earth-sized planets around sun-like stars to date, none. But we can help ourselves just a little bit by looking for the same Earth-sized planets around red dwarf stars, which are 10 to 30% as large as the sun. Now, in that case, because the star is smaller, the same Earth-sized planet is going to generate a much deeper, deeper well, and it's going to make this problem just a little bit easier, but not that easy. We really haven't found that many Earth-sized planets around red dwarf stars yet, but we have candidates. And in my research, what I've decided to do was I decided to build a new observatory dedicated to looking for those Earth-sized planets. And that is the Tierras Observatory. That's the observatory that Mary told you, told you earlier, I'm a PI of. And this is a really old observatory. It's located in Arizona. You can see the aerial right there. It was actually built in 1995. That's the year I was born. Um, and when I started my PhD, we actually I actually took over the telescope because it had been abandoned for like a decade. We took it over, we refurbished it, my team and I refurbished it, we roboticized it, um, and we built a new instrument for it. And to tell you what's special about that instrument, I'm actually going to take you on a very quick journey through it. Um, but Mary and Erica, if I'm going, let me give me, please give me a sense of time. If I'm going over, um, we can, we can advance fast. Okay, awesome. I got it. I got a, I got a thumbs up. All right. So here's, here's what the instrument we built for it looks like. 
So here's the instrument. So at the end of the day, a telescope is a giant light bucket. So what I'm, what I'm showing here is like a cross section of the telescope. So a giant light bucket, and we have a telescope mirror. So instead of filling our bucket with water, we're filling it with light. And the size of the mirror decides how much light you can put on the telescope. In our case, we have a 51 inch primary mirror diameter. And right underneath that diameter, we installed this new and innovative instrument that allows us to find those Earth-sized planets around those red dwarf stars. Remember, that is what the what is the that is what's the goal, what the goal is here at the end of the day. Okay. So imagine that you are a nearby red dwarf star. And by nearby, I mean that your light's going to have to travel something like a hundred trillion miles to make it to the Earth. So you're traveling, traveling, make it to the primary mirror. And then after you hit the primary mirror, that light gets reflected off to the secondary mirror. And after hitting the secondary mirror, it gets reflected off all the way down through the primary mirror hole. And then you hit the new and innovative Tierra's instrument. And the first thing that that light is going to see is this custom filter, and this is a new and, and, and this is a new filter. There's no, there's nothing like it out there. Um, we uh, we um, invented this filter. Basically, what it does is that it it takes only the wavelengths or the portions of light that are not affected by the atmosphere, which, as I told you before, is one of the greatest enemies to ground based astronomy. And so we filter that light. We get only the portions of light that are not affected by water in the atmosphere and by the atmosphere, and we let it through the rest of the system. And then we have a set of coded optics, and these optics increase the field of view of the telescope so that we can do follow up of many more stars in the in the sky, which, like I said, like I showed you before, is a really also a very important aspect of um, of doing this type of research. And this is really not unlike the cameras in your iPhone are. Um, the third camera in your iPhone allows for wider images to be taken. And then after this arduous journey of this light, trillions and trillions of miles and then tons of glass, the light finally makes it through the CCD chip. And then the CCD chip, the light is converted from photons, from light to actually digital images that you can, um, that, that we can analyze in search for planets. My amazing team and I have already spent countless hours designing this instrument, building it in the lab. Then we actually took the whole thing, put the whole thing together, packed it up, shipped it over to Arizona, and then went through a careful procedure in Arizona. Then we overcame a whole bunch of telescope alignment and software issues, spent a lot of nights uh, and a lot of days solving all these problems. And we finally got our Eureka moment. <laughs> so this is the first light image that we ever got this was already a year ago i can't believe it uh and we we're very happy because the quality of the image is really good and that really kind of told me that we we're well on our way to many this many many discoveries and you know the data is coming in fast we have a lot of data that i'm actively analyzing i'll be graduating in may so i definitely have to get this done quickly um but once we find these Earth-sized planets, you know, the, the story's not the story's not done. We really, once we find these Earth-sized planets, we have a lot more work to do. But luckily, we have a lot more telescopes out there. We have Hubble, we have TESS, we have JWST, and we have the upcoming giant Magellan telescope, which are all going to allow us to measure the masses, the atmospheres, and really learn a whole lot more about these planets. So I am so privileged to um to be a, a part of the story of the search for life elsewhere in the universe and it's my privilege to be able to share it with you all if you want any of these materials to share it with your classes in english or spanish please let me know uh and thank you so much mary and erica this has been a true pleasure oh and i'm happy to take questions if we have time yes we we have time for a couple a couple questions and we, we certainly got some in the chat yeah we certainly have some questions so uh, starting earlier in your talk, you asked, um, you were talking about the types and we had a couple of questions, the types of um, detection methods. We had a couple of questions about that. Uh, Jeremy asks, it seems like micro lensing would have to be due to a pretty large planet, wouldn't it? That's a great question. So actually, actually no. <laughs> that's that's one of the that's one of the aspects of the microlensing method that's super surprising is that the magnification 
of the um, basically like the ability of for us to measure that blip that I showed you in the light curve doesn't necessarily have to do with the mass of the with the mass of the object. It more has to do with the geometry of the of the system. And so one of the things that is so exciting about microlensing is that it really gives us the ability to detect very small planets, but also it gives us the ability to do something that we cannot do very easily with any other method we have right now, which is discover planets that are orbiting their stars really far away and that are outside of the galaxy. Yeah, neat. And then another question I want to make sure you get a chance to answer is specifically about your observatory. What is the wavelength of your atmosphere in different filter and bandwidth? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so um, so for the more technically inclined, this filter is centered at eight eight hundred sixty three point five nanometers, and it has a bandwidth of forty nanometers. And so the idea is that you're getting into this region that we call the near infrared, where you don't have, and there's just like a specific little portion of the atmosphere of the of wavelength space is what we call it, where you don't have a lot of tellurics or water features. Um, and it just works mad, it just works really well, does the trick for us. Thank then, you, Dennis, for your question. And then I'm going to ask you to comment on one more comment in the chat. Um, before we move on, which Diane, when listening to your discussion of the kinds of things you're going to find in the atmosphere to determine whether there's life that people are get, right, says, wouldn't that depend on your definition of life? Yeah, I love that question. Okay, so I'll I'll just I'll just write there. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'll answer in the chat to everyone. Oh, awesome. All awesome. Right. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you listening, so much, everyone. Diane. Yeah, and I think there's a few other questions in the chat if you want to take a minute to scroll yeah, back. Yeah, I'll, I'll scroll through. Great. Awesome. All right, so now I'm going to showcase some resources that we have available um, that you might want to use in your various learning environments or opportunities to learn a little bit more yourselves. I'm going to, let's see if I share my screen here, and then I'm going to have to stop sharing in a minute. Oh, that's not the right button. <laughs> All right, that's the button I want. There we go. All right, can we see that? All right. So we've got a number of learning resources available to you. Um, we're gonna start with a couple simple ones, some websites. Juliana showed you one place where you might wanna get some of your exoplanet information. Uh, there's another great NASA resource called exoplanets.nasa.gov. Um, there's some resources there around defining what exoplanets are, the types, overview, some really good background information. Um, we went through it once today, but we know it always helps to kind of go back and to have that place information to share. Um, and another opportunity to kind of see what's out there. Um, at the same site, there's a catalog that you can see to the most up-to-date information as well, uh, displayed in a couple of different interesting um, view views. Um, so there's uh, thankfully, my number matches Juliana, so that's a good sign. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 5,197, that's a good sign that the two uh, NASA websites are in sync. Um, <laughs> we checked at the same time. Um, you can also see the planets by dis uh, discovery method. So the percentage that are um, available you know, are found from the transit versus the direct imaging. You can see a huge difference there and how many we're finding using those different methods. Uh, the planet types, there's a bunch of different interfaces that you might wanna explore of, so you can learn a little bit more about the types of exoplanets out there. All right, then we've got some kind of visualization resources available that you might wanna share with learners. Um, there's five short video interactives um, kind of at the same exoplanet.nasa.gov that show kind of different versions of what of what Juliana showed you of how you might want to visualize these detection methods. I'm not going to show them to you right now just for some time sake and Juliana showed us some great visuals anyways. Um, but I definitely suggest checking out these. Uh, they're, they've got some great explanations along with them as well. Um, then we have uh, view space, the view space interactives. These are really fun. Um, I'm going to actually hop out of my screen share here for a second uh, to show you one in just a second. 
um, that let you explore different features. So you might want to explore how transiting exoplanets work. So you can see it from different angles, including a graph all at the same time and kind of slowly move through it. You can explore the orbits. Um, actually, that's of the <laughs> view there on the right is uh, the TRAPPIST system. Um, you can explore that direct imaging. And I'm going to show you one about oh the atmospheres. That's not what I meant to hit. Me and my screen sharing today. All right, I want to escape. There we go. Uh, that's what I meant to hit. So the view space. Here's an interactive around atmospheres. So Liana can tell us, <laughs> told us a little bit more about how we're looking at the atmospheres of some of these exoplanets as well. Um, and so this allows you to kind of look through and visualize what that absorption might look like at different for different exoplanets. So here we have the temperate Earth side exoplanet where you might see those absorptions. Um, and we can move over to a warm Neptune sized uh, planet. All you know, over to a hot Jupiter-sized planet, and you can see how that's affecting um, the the wavelength that you're viewing, right? Uh, depending on the planet, and so there's the visuals, and then there's some great explanation below uh, to help you kind of unwrap some of these uh, visualizations. Um, there's also a whole series more <laughs> of these uh, view space interactives that can be found on the video library that I think somebody is going to put in the chat for me. Um, oh, I shouldn't have gone back. Um, so the ViewSpace uh, video library also has some straight videos as well to explore different topics. Um, so great opportunity to dive in and share resources with students. Um, there's also the Universe Unplugged video series, the Habitable Zone video series are uh, great short videos to introduce that wh where are we finding planets that are the right distance uh, from their host stars that would support life, the Habitable Zone, and what does it take to detect these? Um, so these are kind of short little introductory videos, um, kind of five to ten minutes, great for sharing. Then I'm going to actually let Mary, I'll, I'll drive Mary if you want to talk about it a little bit. Okay. Uh, eyes on exoplanets, which I have to open up here. So this is a um, great visualization tool based on the data um, of those thousands of planets uh, in which um, it's a 3D environment. And I'm not sure Zoom does it justice here if you have it on your own uh, computer where you're seeing um, uh, uh, the 3D spatial distribution of discovered exoplanets around the solar system. And of course, that big, that big cone of uh, exoplanets is the area in the sky where Kepler was staring for many, many years. And so many exoplanets found at all distances in that direction. You can click on any of those um, uh, dots, or you can also use the search tools if there's a planet that you uh, uh, want to know more about and uh, kind of see a visualization of its orbit, where it is in relationship to the habitable zone, uh, uh, um, get it, get a um, uh, kind of an artist's conception of, of uh, what it might look like, depending on if it's a terrestrial or a hot Jupiter. If you click on planet there, you can, oh, she already zoomed in. There it is. <laughs> so the visualization of um, uh, K299 here. And so um, uh, there's a lot. You can compare its size to Jupiter or to, to the Earth or and get a feel for the fact that a lot of these are that um, uh, um, Super. Actually, not a lot of the discovered ones are are the size that uh, Juliana talked about. Statistically, most of them are, but but in this uh, distribution, you find a lot of hot Jupiters. Um, so it's a great visualization tool if students are observing or uh, doing some research. At next uh, webinar, if we talk about um, 
using DIY planet search to explore a particular hot Jupiter, they can find that planet in this visualization tool and learn more about it. Um, so that's all uh, the kinds of things that you can explore. I, I definitely encourage you if you haven't used this to try it out. That's called Eyes on Exoplanets. Um, and I'm sure knowing Rachel, she's already put that in the chat for me. <laughs> All right, um, so we're making our way through some visualizations. Um, there's also AstroPix. Uh, this is a great opportunity if you want some images for your space, for your classroom, for your after school center, um, to get some really great visualizations of exoplanets. Like we said, we've, uh, we don't know what they look like exactly, but there's some really great artist renderings of what we imagine some of these exoplanets might look like. Uh, there's also some great comparisons here. Uh, these are all available to you for download, to share, to use. All right. Um, speaking of inspiration, the Exoplanet Travel Bureau resource is also a great set of resources. There's a number of travel posters um, that kind of put us in the explorer seat of um, imagining what it might be like to go to these places, um, to go to these exoplanets that we've yet to see, right? That we're just starting to imagine and envision. Um, and I'll show you how a couple educators have actually used that in some program models I'm gonna show in just a second. Uh, there's also some coloring books for uh, coloring pages for anybody that needs some space filler, some time filler. Um, and there's some really beautiful artistry involved in them. Uh, there is also in here, you can see uh, a scale model system that you can use to uh, pace it out in your you know, down your hallway, in your back field, uh, down your, you know, corner block, whatever might make sense for your space, uh, that also shares some great information. Um, this is the TRAPPIST-1 system, so you could do a comparison uh, scale model to the Earth, uh, to the, our solar system. That's uh, a great opportunity to get around what Juliana was saying, that there's lots of different types of systems, star systems, and ours, we don't know where we fit in yet, but it's very different from some of the systems that we know. Um, there's also a complete resource guide from NASA's Universe of Learning. Uh, and this resource guide is available in both English and in Spanish uh, that walks you through some background information, some of these downloadable posters. So a lot of the things that I just showed you are actually all together in this one resource guide. Some activities, presentations and talks, all sorts of multimedia resources, puts it all together in one place for you to access. Um, so that was put together by our team, but we also think it's really important for you to have access to program models that are put together by other educators like you. How are they using them in this space? Um, so I'm gonna highlight two here, but um, the University of Learning runs an informal learning network and we've worked with um, dozens and dozens of <laughs> educators uh, at various sites across the country. Um, and so there's a number of these program models around exoplanets, but I'm gonna showcase two here. One is these exoplanet travel kits created by the Evergreen Aviation Museum. Uh, their program model actually is multiple program models in one. Uh, they've created an opportunity for students to explore these exoplanets and think about what it would mean to actually visit one, right? What would they have to take into consideration? A lot of these exoplanets are very different from Earth. Uh, so after gaining some background knowledge on exoplanets, they're actually expected to design their own habitation on an exoplanet, right? So think about what might be different from a water world or a hot Jupiter, what that might mean. And they actually have these guides for everything from second through fifth, a middle school guide and a high school guide uh, connected to NGSS standards. Uh, so all put together and how they explore this for students. And there's some PowerPoints available, a number of resources that you really can take it and go or customize it to your own setting. But this is a really great opportunity to put the exoplanets in context. We also, for those of you who are kind of looking to get creative, with your exoplanet exploration. Um, I love, this is one of my favorite program models from the Springfield Museum of Art, who created um, artful exoplanets, creating imaginary worlds. So students took the base of understanding what exoplanets are and started envisioning them for themselves, but artistically, uh, instead of thinking about what it might take to visit it, what are these exoplanets and what could it look like? And then what kind of creatures might live on it and what might they need to be? 
Um, and so there's full guides on how to create, recreate some of their artistic renderings. So you can see some drawings here. Um, so there's techniques on that. There's these little books that they've put together here. Um, and so there's a guide on how you might create those books and what students might wanna put in it. So what do they know? They can learn about a specific exoplanet, share the information that they know, add a drawing, think about a creature that might live there and what might adaptations might they have to have to live on that water world or um, how Jupiter or whatever planet it might be. Uh, so this is a really fun guide uh, opportunity for students to engage a little more deeply and, and creatively in exoplanets. Um, but like I said, these are just two of the program models available um, from our number of our, our community partners, and you can take them and use them as is or modify them to your sites. Um, so those are the resources. I know I went through them kind of quickly, but we are going to share all of these with you, um, after our slides and the recording afterwards. Great. Thanks, Erica. Yes, we will make sure that everyone gets um, a, a copy of the recording and of these these slides so that you can get all those um, links to resources for sharing uh, exoplanet discovery with uh, learners of all ages. Um, so at, at this point, I just want to um, kind of look forward to the next two uh, webinars in the series. Um, in this case, we kind of had an introduction to the uh, exciting science field, along with the uh, introductory resources to explore exoplanets. In December, we're going to um, kind of talk about how you and your uh, students or a, a group of learners can actually participate in collecting data and analyzing it, um, uh, uh, real data to, to uh, uh, make discoveries about exoplanets. And in session three in January, how you can use that data to actually contribute to exoplanet science. If you go to the next slide, Erica, the se uh, session in December, we'll be exploring um, a program we run out of our microobservatory group here at the Center for Astrophysics called DIY Planet Search, where we use our small six inch telescopes, but um, small telescopes can do a lot when it comes to exoplanet uh, research. And we, um, uh, you can analyze, you can gather uh, data from some of these hot Jupiters and generate your own light curve uh, and draw conclusions about the orbit, the size uh, and uh, of that planet based on your very own data. And then in um, January, uh, we will um, uh, introduce you to Exoplanet Watch, which is a citizen science project where people with small telescopes, including those who use microobservatory data, um, can actually contribute their data to um, a project to refine the uh, orbits, to kind of use crowdsourcing of all this data contributed uh, by lots of people to um, uh, refine the what's called the ephemerides or the the um, t uh, the periods and orbital periods of uh, of exoplanets, and that helps with future missions to uh, optimize and save time on space missions. So you aren't trying to look for the transit happening a minute earlier than it actually is going to happen. So um, uh, that's an exciting project. We'll hear about that in January, and. Um, we're kind of at our hour. The, we have a few comments in the um, uh, chat. We'll try to uh, see if we can get some, if there's answers we didn't get to, we'll try and collect some of those. And in the email we send out to you with the follow-up, we'll try to get to some of those. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Juliana. That was so exciting and wonderful. We really appreciate your um, coming today and thank all of you for coming. And I hope that many of you uh, are going to share this information uh, with learners and get them excited about exoplanets as well. All right.